Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, will the recent banking troubles have an impact on farmers? Zach Ashmore takes a look. Plus, farmers in East Palestine are worried about their soils after that huge train derailment. In Southern Gardening, won't be long before spring, Gary shows how to make it extra colorful. And in our feature, meet Miss Ruby, the queen of 4-H, and she has her own museum. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. And of course, one of the biggest stories on everyone's mind, the bank collapse and shutdown that happened late last week. Zach will have more on that in his market segment coming up. In the meantime, late-breaking developments in that Ukrainian grain deal. It appears that the UN and Russia have agreed to a 60-day extension following negotiations in Geneva. The original deal was set to expire on March 18th. In this video from last year, negotiators met at a joint coordination center in Istanbul, Turkey. There, the original deal was struck, allowing Ukraine, a world ag powerhouse, to ship grain and help avoid a global food shortage. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Vershinin emphasized that the extension was to last only 60 days, saying that, quote, Further, grain policy will depend on normalization of ag imports. The EPA will start testing farm soil in East Palestine, Ohio, six weeks after that toxic train derailment. There, 40% of Columbiana County is farmland. The state ag department continues to promise that crops and animals are safe, but farmers aren't so sure. Some farmers say there's been a lack of consumer confidence in their products. Many of them recently went to the Ohio Department of Agriculture's roundtable meeting. The group's director says the county is producing normal, healthy food and will continue monitoring. But within days, the EPA is beginning soil testing for farms in and around East Palestine, looking specifically for ash and soot left over from the train car fire to test for chemicals, despite multiple days of rain that followed. Some farmers have had their soil tested privately. Those results have come back safe though more private testing is likely. In the meantime, farmers say their confidence isn't fully restored despite the roundtable. At least one plans to move her cattle 30 miles away sometime in May. The president recently unveiled his $7 trillion budget. It calls for higher taxes on the wealthy and large corporations. Much of the ag portion was left unchanged, though it does include a new rule for country of origin labeling, COOL. Peter Tubbs has the story. The USDA announced a new rule that would clarify labeling of food products. Under the proposed regulation, meat, poultry, and egg products would qualify for a product of USA or made in the USA label if they are derived from animals born, raised, slaughtered, and processed in the United States. The label would continue to be voluntary and does not need to be pre-verified. However, producers and processors would be required to retain documentation in case their claim was ever challenged. The new regulations close a loophole in the labeling system. Current policy allows a product of USA label if the product passed through a USDA inspected processing plant, regardless of where the animal was born or raised. New language allows for use of the label on packages containing meat from other countries, but companies are required to list all of the processing steps on the label. The USDA believes the new regulations will reduce consumer confusion, increase clarity on the origin of food products, and match consumer expectations. Canada and Mexico have long disputed any labeling program in the United States, arguing that labels put imported products at a competitive disadvantage. The National Farmers Union praised the proposed rule, while the National Cattlemen's Beef Association called the new language deeply flawed and that it fails to deliver profitable solutions for U.S. cattle producers. This is the first change to food labeling since 2013, when the WTO ruled the mandatory country of origin labels placed a disproportionate burden on meat producers and processors. Country of origin labeling was originally introduced in the 2008 Farm Bill. 
The comment period is open for 60 days. Despite much distraction on Capitol Hill, prep work continues on the next farm bill. Recently, the House Ag Committee held yet another hearing. Despite an ethanol victory, there wasn't much discussion of biofuels among the rural Americans who brought their concerns to Congress. The House Agriculture Committee held a hearing focused on the rising costs of agricultural inputs and where the 2023 Farm Bill can help provide certainty to America's farmers. Pesticides, our fertilizers were tripled and quadrupled in cost. Has it gotten, has it become better for the, our farmers right now in this area? And what can we do to do better? We have seen a softening in the market uh, recently, so prices have come down, in some cases, half the cost of what they were last year. Uh, several reasons for that. One, I think farmers are waiting and uh, wait and see approach, and so that softened the market a little. But some of the global markets, as I referenced, have also opened back up. So you see a lot more product moving that uh, impacts that, that supply and demand all over the world, whether it's India or, or Brazil. Could you just talk about some of the current legal barriers and liabilities that face farmers who try to fix their own equipment that they own um, or that uh, have to rely on a third party to do so? This uh, barrier, uh, we've had promises in the past uh, from the equipment manufacturers that they will allow access to this information and allow some um, uh, independent repair. Uh, that, however, uh, did not come through. Uh, so we, we need to see uh, laws in the books to enforce that right to repair. Is China meeting its trade agreements that they made with the previous administration? Do we need to be doing more to hold their feet to the fire? You know, fa the phase one trade agreement was huge for agriculture. Uh, and did they meet it? Totally no. And they didn't meet it in the, in the second year of it. Uh, but that trade agreement uh, was really uh, helpful to our farmers and ranchers and, 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 and put us in that market to be able to sell to them. And, and we need more trade agreements like that, but we need to hold their feet to the fire, just like we need to hold Mexico's feet to the fire when it comes to biotech and their discussion around not taking our corn. On the lighter side, in our Southern Gardening segment, we spend a lot of time talking about color. With Mississippi's rich soil and abundant water supply, it's easy to create an explosion of color. And with that, here's Gary Bachman with one of the most colorful flowers there is. I think one of the classic summer plants for our Mississippi gardens has to be bougainvillea. This tropical plant is perfect in a hanging basket or container on the porch and patio. Today's Southern Gardening is visiting Rivers Nursery for a good look at these plants that require little care and can return many years of enjoyment. These bougainvillea baskets will develop long arching branches as the summer progresses. Be careful when handling because of the sharp thorns on the stems. The flowers are available in a variety of colors, but did you know they're not actually flowers? They're really modified leaves called bracts and have a papery texture and surround the white tubular flowers. Best growth is achieved by full sun exposure. These plants are also heavy feeders and will benefit from monthly applications of water-soluble fertilizer. But the plants actually require very little irrigation, so be careful not to overwater in between feedings. Bougainvillea will begin to bloom in the spring and fall. The flowers are produced in cycles of about six weeks, followed by a rest period. Bougainvillea can be pruned any time to keep the plant neat. Pruning after a flowering cycle will encourage branching, which leads to more flowers during the next bloom cycle. In the fall, bougainvillea should be brought inside and placed in a window with high light for indoor flowering to brighten the winter months. The Rivers family brought this plant into the greenhouse many years ago, and look how it has grown into a bougainvillea tree. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, they call her Miss Ruby, and they call her an inspiration. In Lee County, Mississippi, she's the state's longest-serving 4-H volunteer. Farm Week's Jonah Holland, a longtime 4-H'er himself, goes one-on-one -on -one with the woman everyone says is everything a 4-H leader should be. 
and who created a museum with memories she's been collecting for 56 years. Miss Ruby, up close and personal, that's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. Taking care of what matters, MSU Extension. Time for the market report, very busy this past week. That's right, first we had the WASI report, then the bust of SVB, and mm -hmm. we'll get into all of that. But first, the numbers, a bit of a mixed bag, and then a deeper look into the WASI report. What did it say and what effect did it have? And finally, in our row report, a look into SVB and what else is moving the markets. So, market split, row crops on the downswing, let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, wheat, down 29 and a quarter cents. We'll take a closer look into that one in a bit. It's followed by cotton at about six cents, but that's a 7.21% drop from the previous week. Last week's biggest gain, lumber, up nearly 47 bucks. That's a 12.60 cent percent rise from the previous week. So, this month's WASI report dropped last week, and as usual, it had an effect on prices. The real question is, by how much? This time, I'm thinking quite a bit, because the day after it dropped, prices saw a big dip down, at least for row crops. Here's what it said. U.S. wheat supply and demand outlook unchanged from last month. Projected season average farm price remains $9 per bushel. Global wheat supply is slightly lower. Global production raised 5.1 million tons on increases for Kazakhstan, Australia, and India. Trade increased 1 million tons. Use forecast 2 million tons up. Ending stocks down 2.1 million tons. U.S. corn exports down 75 million bushels due to poor pace of sales and shipments. Ending stocks up 75 million bushels. Season average farm price $6.60 per bushel. Global corn production down mostly due to heat and dryness in Argentina. Imports down. Ending stocks also down 296.5 million tons, mostly due to declines in Ukraine and Brazil. U.S. rice exports down 3 million hundredweight to 59 million, the lowest since 1985 and 86. Ending stocks raised to 36.1 million hundredweight. All rice season average farm price unchanged at $19.40 per hundredweight. Global rice supplies raised 7 million tons, mostly on higher Indian production. Consumption raised 2.8 million tons. Trade up 0.9 million tons. Ending stocks up 4.2 million tons, with China and India accounting for 81% of the stocks. U.S. soybean exports raised 25 million bushels due to higher than expected shipments. Crush reduced slightly. Ending stocks down 15 million bushels. Soy oil exports also down 200 million pounds. Season average farm price unchanged at $14.30 per bushel. 
Global soybean production down due to weather issues in Argentina. Uruguay production also down. Exports higher in U.S. and Brazil. Imports higher for Argentina and Turkey. Crush lowered 3.3 million tons. U.S. beef production raised on slaughter projections. Pork production lowered due to higher than expected pace of slaughter. Broiler and turkey production up while egg production slightly down. U.S. milk production up on higher cow inventory. Cheese prices lower due to higher supplies. Butter and whey prices raised while non-fat dry milk prices unchanged. All milk price forecast $20.45 per hundred weight. U.S. cotton supply and demand forecasts unchanged relative to last month. Projected season average farm price unchanged at 83 cents per pound. Global cotton beginning stocks 900,000 bales up due to China and Uzbekistan consumption estimates. World consumption 555,000 bales lower. Imports also lower. Production 700,000 bales up due to larger crops in China, Australia, and Uzbekistan. This week in our row report, there's a lot going on this past week, and there are two big factors to talk about. We start with the second largest bank collapse in U.S. history, the Silicon Valley Bank. Why would that impact agriculture? Well, it's too early to see the full fallout, but there are two things to consider. One, it's put attention on other banks concerning loans. Many farmers borrow money to tide them over until harvest when they pay it back with their profits. And two, SVB invested in tech, and anyone who's been in the field recently can see there's a lot of tech going on in modern farm equipment. This collapse could hinder development. Another market factor to consider, there's an important date coming up, March 18th. What makes this date so important? That's when the safe shipping agreement between Ukraine and Russia expires. As we mentioned earlier, it's been extended. But if it ends for some reason, it'll be harder for Ukraine to export its grain. Now that you have some context, market analyst Jeff French gives us the deeper analysis. You know, I'm going to wait till after those negotiations are done, but it would not surprise me if the funds sell this thing because they are short about 100 to 120,000 contracts. So they want it to go lower. That, that is their bet. It would not surprise me if they sell this thing right into the negotiations, get all this bearish material out of it, the deal is signed, and then we're kind of done going down. Because if it is they don't get a deal done, you're taking about 3 million metric tons of grain per month off the world market. Well, I think you have to look at what happened here this week. I mean, it, it wasn't mainly fundamentals. I mean, some of it was because of the decrease in exports, which increased the corn carryout. But the, the, the stock market was down 1,400 points this week. Uh, you know, there was bigger things going on. One of the, you know, the second biggest bank failure ever in the history of the United States happened this week. Uh, so there was outside markets that were collapsing, big sell-offs. I think it spilled over it. But you look at the wheat, the wheat's been down $1.30 in the last three weeks. That has definitely affected the corn price. But you look at the last three months, I mean, the, the beans have been a very tradable market. Uh, the low side support 1480, the high side where it's resistance 1540 to 1550, because every time we get a big rally, the Brazilian come in and start selling. They are only about 35% sold. Uh, they are estimated at the end of this week, 60% harvested. So they have a big crop coming. They have plenty of beans left to sell. That's why you see when we go up to 1550, we fail. But then all of a sudden we get back down to 1480, the, the selling dries up and we kind of come back. What I want to see is when we break out of that support or the resistance, where we go from there. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Last week was quite a ride there at the end with both WASD and SVB at the end. The latter's fallout could last the next several months. At the very least, things seem somewhat precarious. Mike? Thank you, Zach. In this week's feature, a story we really look forward to bringing you. They call her Miss Ruby, and she's been a big part of the 4-H experience for a lot of Mississippi youth. But there's much more to Miss Ruby's extraordinary story than you might think. Farm Week's Jonah Holland has more. I just love people. It makes me happy, it makes my heart cool. And so I just love people. When I lay down at night, I think about the children that went through with me during 4-H. Ruby Beckley is Mississippi 4-H's longest serving volunteer. She's spent the last 56 years dedicated to serving Lee County and youth across the state. She's who we should all strive to be where 4-H is concerned. She is what a good leader should be. She cares about her people, she cares about her 4-H'ers, she cares about the volunteers, and like I said, she's just an inspiration. When you said make the best better, that's what she done. She made the best better, so 
In her career, she's made an impact on countless 4-H'ers. Well, I see that children need some help, and I want them to keep moving on. I love the children, they love me. You see, I've been all over the United States with children, and I love it because them children, they love to work and, and raise their own money to get buses and cars and things, and we've been all over the United States. I've even been to the Bahamas with children. It's about learning, learning and doing working. If they have a project, they need to work on their project. A lot of children don't even know how to publish speak. So you need to start them to working with 4-H. 4-H is a word, learn by doing. I say it's about 4-H doing what they need to do, working, making the best better for this United States of America. That's what it needs to be. Young people need to know that 4-H would help them in this United States. Get money. They always begging for money. Why not work and get the money? Because you can get it through four way You can get scholarships and all those good things. Not only is she an inspiration to youth, but to other volunteer leaders as well. Because when you think about the R in her name, you think about how reliable she is, how she takes on responsibility, how she just, she just rises up and go to the U. I think of her as being unique. There's only one, Miss Ruby. And when I think about the B, she's a believer. A believer. She believes in what she's doing. And she never falls short. If I see the why, I think about the yearning. How she just yearns to do more and more and keep others going. Not only children, but adults. She leaves an impact on you. A lasting impact. That no one, no one can take away all that Miss Ruby. Ruby says she's kept every piece of 4-H memorabilia since 1968 and has turned her garage into her very own museum. I said, Lord, I wonder what I could do with all these pictures. The Lord said, do a museum. And that's what I began to do myself. I started nailing pictures upside the wall. You see my picture back there? I started, and I had pictures all and I moved them down there. And every picture that I had in the box of thing, I pulled them out and nailed them upside the wall. And that's how I started that music in. It is an absolute time capsule of what 4-H is and has been for the last 50, 56 years. I mean, it, it's wonderful. It's not only Starlight 4-H club members in there. I think she got an entire Lee County 4-Hers in there. You know, cause she said, I said, that's my daughter right there. She said, I didn't know I'd put your daughter in here. I said, well, you got them all. You got all the 4-H's uh, that's been through Lee County. She has it in that museum. I want people from far and near to come see the museum and see what 4-H was about. Some people don't know. I did a lot of work, man, from the, for the years from way back there in 68. You know I've been rich, cause I work for eight. I've been rich. And y'all can get rich too, but you gotta get yourself involved, amen. So y'all get involved with 4-H and I tell you, you gonna move on up. So y'all instill in your children that 4-H is what's moving now. You know that? 4-H is moving and it gonna move on cause I'm gonna be praying for the children that do want to do something in 4-H. Great story. And here with us in studio, the storyteller himself, Farm Week's Jonah Holland, who, as it turns out, has quite a history with Miss Ruby. Jonah, I bet you had a lot of fun shooting this one. Absolutely, Mike. Let me tell you, it was such a pleasure getting to work with Miss Ruby and get to tell her story a little bit. Not only have I known her the majority of my life as one of the 4-H'ers who looked up to her, she's been a huge inspiration to my family as well. You know, you said that she's a 4-H volunteer, but I don't know how much detail we got into that. So what exactly did she do as a 4-H volunteer? You know, Zach, Miss Ruby is one of the volunteers in 4-H that just makes things happen. She's one of the volunteers that really gets kids involved in 4-H and makes sure they stay involved. She gets them to functions, makes sure those functions happen. She really does it all. 
took a long time, I'm sure, to assemble. She says she's been collecting all of this stuff since 1968. Uh, what were some of the things that you saw in, in that museum? You know, it was remarkable. She really did keep everything 4-H related she's ever touched, it seemed like. You know, everything from ribbons and awards that some of her 4-Hers has won, to photos and memorabilia from events. Funny enough, Mike, I was even in the background of one of the photos that she had up on the wall. Uh, just funny coincidences here and there, and as a 4 h -er, it was truly, truly inspirational to see that museum put together. And she just seems like a really sweet, sweet lady. Oh, she's one of the sweetest I've ever known. Well, I, I, I saw that you and Brian had a good time uh, filming there. Uh, how big was this museum? You know, interestingly enough, that museum is only big enough for about, uh, well, the size is about a one-car garage. Um, so it's not as big as you would think for just as much as she has in there. <laughs> Great job. Again, sweet story. Thank you, Jonah. Well, next time on Farm Week, a virus success story, kind of. It struck fear in humans for generations. Now it looks less like this and more like this, rabies. Used to be we worried more about our pets. Now rabies is more likely to come from wildlife and it can still be fatal. So experts fly the country, dropping thousands of special vaccine packets from Maine to Alabama. Winning the war on rabies, that's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.